Okay, everybody, we're getting ready to start. Um, anybody who's still outside, please come on in. There's seats still available. Anybody? Uh, just wanted to say a few things before we get started. Um, if you have a cell phone, I'm sure everybody does, uh, put it on vibrate, please, during the presentation. Uh, and also, feel free to come and go uh, if you want. There, the food and drink will be served all night. There is an overflow viewing room just at the back corner as well. Um, and any other notes? No? All right. Have a good time. Yeah, I think we're ready to start. Great. So, welcome. And applause. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the Boston Scientific Connected Patient Challenge Pitch Off. I'm Jennifer Joe. I'm Jim Ryan. And we're the co-founders of Medstro and MedTech Boston, uh, the organizers of the challenge, and we'll be your MCs for the evening. We're so excited that Boston Scientific is invested in the medical innovation community and is the sponsor of the challenge that has culminated in this lovely event this evening. Um, we're going to get started by telling you a little bit about what brought us here. Yes, uh, so I mean, I'm at that age where I think both of them are equally blurry. <laughs> All right, glasses are better. Um, I blew with the font for you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So uh, six teams are going to present uh, for you tonight, um, and it's going to be kind of like a Shark Tank style, so they'll have seven minutes to present, and then the judges will ask them questions for another seven minutes. Um, these six teams were selected uh, using uh, after uh, three months of online competition. Jennifer's going to tell you about that. Um, but the, uh, the big important thing for tonight is uh, we're going to be choosing a winner and a runner-up. The winner will get $35,000 in in-kind services from Boston Scientific to help them productize their idea, as well as $15,000 in Google Cloud Platform credits that they can use uh, to utilize the Google Cloud Platform. And then the runner-up will be getting uh, $15,000 in in-kind services from Boston Scientific and $10,000 of Google Cloud credits. Which is exciting. Is that enough to build your spaceship that you've been talking about? My spaceship. Depends on how safe you want it to be, but sure we can do something. I better leave that to Elon Musk. OK. Oh, I'm, I'm up again. Uh, so they, uh, anyone who's been here uh, who came last year, um, we had uh, a bunch of teams fly in from, from all over. This year is, is the same, although the the local Boston teams uh, made a strong showing this year. Half of our teams are from Boston. Yay, so good Boston! News, Boston. <laughs> uh, and we had teams from as far away as uh, San Francisco as well. So uh, we thank the teams for taking time to come in. Yes, but how did we come up with these six finalist teams? We all know that innovation in healthcare today does not happen in a silo. It's an open dialogue, a collaborative process, and a building of a community. For that reason, Boston Scientific launched their second annual Connected Patient Challenge in September. For three months, clinicians, engineers, scientists, patients, and entrepreneurs from all over the world submitted their ideas for using big data to improve patient outcomes, increase efficiency in delivering care, and drive down the cost of care. There were 46 total submissions. Given the expertise in Massachusetts, many were local, but we also had submissions from across the US and around the world, including Palo Alto, California, Beaufort, South Carolina, Denver, Colorado, Duluth, Georgia, London, England, and Tel Aviv, Israel. Yes, um, and during the online portion, um, before we all got here today to, to view our six finalists, uh, we had 21 judge slash mentors, and that's part of the format that we use online so that um, after the teams submit their idea, uh, they have uh, two to three months during which the, they can get feedback, not just from the, the judge mentors, but also from judge mentors. That sounds like they're very judgmental. Um, <laughs> mentor judges. And Boston is not that. <laughs> yes. Uh, that, that, that actually wasn't scripted. Um, the mentor judges, uh, but also anyone in the community could just you know, leave a comment, say, hey, that, that looks really interesting. Have you thought about this? Or maybe this will apply to this other thing. And so we had this great conversation happen. Um, then we opened up the voting, which is another exciting part of the online challenge, where we had 1,700 people vote. Um, and uh, we had votes from all 50 states, from 52 countries, a uh, total of nearly uh, 2,500 followers and 130,000 uh, page views. So very, very popular. 
And uh, I just wanted to thank um, you know, our online judges, some of them are here, as well as Boston Scientific for supporting innovation uh, in Boston and around the world. No, that was like this was Uh, so, to get us started, um, we'd like to invite uh, David Knapp, the Vice President of Research and Development at Boston Scientific, to give us some opening remarks. David? Okay, I'll use this. Um, <clears throat> first of all, I just want to say how excited I am to be here today at this event. And I wanted to thank uh, all of you for coming uh, here and participating in this discussion. Um, you know, this is the actually the second year that we have uh, had our Connected Patient Challenge. And uh, actually, uh, I did want to uh, mention that the winners from uh, the first year are here, I believe, WashRx. And I, I don't know where, where you're located, but if you could just kind of stand up. And, and you know, we've been working with this team. Uh, we've been working with this team uh, pretty steadily through through the past year, and it's just been a delight uh, to to interface with them as well as the, the Google team uh, to really advance uh, what their solution is. Um, so I encourage you to to uh, talk to them afterwards about their experience. So this is really all about, for Boston Scientific, it's really all about encouraging discussion in a space which is becoming so important to us, uh, which is data analytics and digital health. And I wanted to talk uh, about some of, some of the goals and the reasons why we do this. So, um, <clears throat> oh, I was supposed to take this off, so I will do that. Um, so, you know, the, fir the first thing I want to say is that uh, from a visibility perspective, this is, a, uh, I think, a great forum for us. We've seen uh, really increased discussion about uh, big data and data analytics uh, within many venues uh, since we started, uh, put out our challenge, both on the website, uh, through the conversations that we've had there, um, and the conversations in the media. And now, uh, tonight, uh, we're hoping to continue that with the uh, groups that you'll see today, which are the cream of the crop of the ideas that we uh, generated. Um, and of course, we want to encourage early stage investment in these ideas because we think uh, ultimately that data analytics is a core part of digital health, which uh, basically, if you think about uh, the value that we see in that, it really has to do with improving the access uh, for healthcare, reducing costs, and really going after improving outcomes. Uh, and expanding kind of the view that, that a company like Boston Scientific has uh, of healthcare through uh, this, these kinds of solutions and technology. Um, so I guess I'll, I'll wrap that up. I'd like to introduce our next speaker. Uh, and I'm trying to see where, okay, oh, great. I'd like to introduce our next speaker uh, who, uh, is the founder of Boston Scientific, uh, John Abley, who has been an inspiration for me and for so many, uh, as well as, I think, a thought leader in innovation and collaboration. So John, welcome. <laughs> Thank, thanks, Dave. And, and first of all, congratulations to our final six. And uh, you've, you've made it a long way, and uh, I know what that goes through. It's, it's a fascinating process. Developing a, a company that does something is uh, really, it's an exciting thing, but it's obviously got a lot of pain points. Uh, uh, some of you are familiar with this, this uh, book here. Uh, what is it, 1997, uh, that Clayton Christensen wrote. And uh, in it, he introduced the concept of disruptive uh, innovation. Now, we all know about disruptive. <laughs> he didn't have to tell us. But it's the twist that he put on it, including the fact that frequently you end up disrupting yourself. That's not what your goal is. You know, the, the famous story was the Selectric typewriter uh, that IBM, you know, developed. But they sat on it for 10 years because they were afraid it would, it would ruin their market. Kodak, you know, also developed digital, <laughs> digital imaging. They didn't do it quite right. So. Uh, it's, it's interesting to think about some of the things you're doing have interesting technical uh, challenges, but they also have political challenges. And uh, what uh, uh, 
Clay Christensen wrote about in his other series of, of innovation books, because he took on healthcare, he took on education, he's still taking on education. <laughs> it's, it's really an impossible task. Uh, but he came up with some really dramatic innovations. By the way, he took on Harvard Business School, uh, and he competed with, uh, who's his, uh, the other famous marketing guy. Uh, but anyway, he lost. Uh, when, you're, when you're in the, yeah, ac Michael Porter, when you're in that academic world, uh, uh, the, the having the, the faculty on your side is, is a big deal. And uh, Michael Porter wanted to tweak it, and Clay wanted to blow it up. So guess who won? <laughs> um, and they also wrote articles on, you know, can you disrupt healthcare? Well, a lot of people have been trying, and it's, it's not, not, not very easy. But think for a second about what disruption means. It, when you have disruptive technology, the user is at risk. <laughs> you're not going to make friends with people who are in the field now. So you've got to understand that. It's going to be used differently and maybe used in a different place. Uh, it's obviously the cost uh, curve, if you will, is going to be different. And the thing that a lot of people forget is the unintended side effect of whatever it is you're doing. You can think ahead and ought to think ahead, but it's those unintended side effects that kill you. Uh, it's not just the technological aspects of disruption that are problematic. It's all the factors. And uh, you, know, you can be killed by Twitter today. You, know, you couldn't be killed years ago because it didn't exist. And uh, by the way, somebody told me a great joke about the fact that, that the solution for Mexico to ha stop uh, Donald from, from dumping on him was to buy Twitter. <laughs> now, yeah, that's innovation. That's, that's what I want to get that point. Uh, I, I, I was at a, a place last week talking a little bit about uh, disruption in the endovascular field. And of course, it's been enormous. And I'd like to see the, uh, the historical aspect of it. And it was kind of interesting because one of the big breakthroughs came from this guy here. His name was Charlie Dodder. Uh, he was out in Oregon. He was actually a radiologist, but he stuck catheters everywhere. And he was a, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to do it, and you'll, you'll live with it type of guy. But the problem was, although he was technically very, very creative, he was not the best communicator in the world. He was a communicator that was good in terms of stories he could tell, but he tended to hyperbolize everything, and he told surgeons that he was going to put them out of business. Mistake. Those guys were on top. And then this guy, Andreas Grunzig, came along basically a decade later. And Andreas Grunzig was sort of a, a lowly guy in, in Switzerland. Uh, and his skill sets were very different. Uh, he really was very careful in terms of the things that he did. So he became a very credible young man. Uh, he. Uh, entertained a number of individuals alone, but then this being in the late 70s, think about that uh, time period for a second. What was invented at that point? Basically, it was consumer video. That changed the world, particularly in medicine, because they used to do films and so forth and it was limited, and, and uh, uh, video gave them live, real time uh, communication. Uh, he had a lot of unique characteristics to think about. Once you've solved the problem, how do you get it out to the marketplace? In fact, marketplace is probably the wrong word. How do you get it accepted by the public at large? Uh, Grunzig had a combination of attributes that are very, very unusual uh, for a physician, for, for anybody. The visionary, the scientist, the clinician, the educator, wow, those things don't normally go together. And he certainly was a great communicator. Uh, in his case, it was a balloon catheter. He made it himself on his kitchen table. And in fact, he made the first year's supply. <laughs> sort of pretty amazing. And it was an incredible production. Uh, it was only available for one source. Uh, it was very difficult to make. But that was a good thing, because that sort of controlled being end run by somebody else. Um, he personally reviewed each sale. 
He really cared. He recognized that the early users are going to determine the reputation of whatever it is you're doing. So having somebody who's excited is one thing. Having them credible to the larger community is absolutely another. Because early adopters tend to be, excuse me, bullshitters. And, and <laughs> therefore, they are more of a problem. I've come across a lot of people who were, had some great technology, but the problem was they came with it. <laughs> and, and, and we weren't, we weren't going to uh, touch him. Uh, Gruntzig was a phenomenal educator. Uh, he was a magician. And he pioneered the concept of the, of the live tutorial, where basically they would treat a patient, patient live in front of a live audience. There's the advantage of video. And uh, he would be talking to the students, if you will, in many places where they were a lot older and more famous than he was. Uh, and they would actually talk to him and ask him questions while he was treating the patient. So he could walk and chew gum at the same time. And uh, it became a phenomenal educational experience. Uh, he also didn't concentrate on one party. He was actually trained as an angiologist, which is sort of unique to Europe, uh, disease of vessels anywhere. And uh, he wanted to communicate the concept to everybody. And he understated things. An inventor understating? I mean, very, very amazing to watch. Uh, he developed a protocol and a registry from the very first case he did. He was monitoring. But he wasn't monitoring the way NIH does or the FDA does. He monitored in a very practical way. He got a group of really good clinicians together. And they said, these are the variables we want to do. He understood that if he had too many check boxes in that list, it wouldn't get filled out. And, and if, if it goes through a government process, every little place has to have their own contribution. And it's 50 pages long, and it doesn't get filled out. Uh, the other thing, he re, really redefined the way research on new techniques was done. He took the lowest risk cases first. Uh, by the way, this was because he did have one high risk case, which was a disaster. And uh, he convinced the people that he was uh, going to be able to do it. And uh, the other thing was sort of interesting. It was done mostly with private support, uh, and uh, it wasn't government support or professional society support or medical support. Very simply, he avoided the politics that come, come with that. And that was what was really amazing. But he also had a little bit of luck. This guy, his name is Aki Senning. Among other things, he's the father of the pacemaker. He was a Swedish, very famous Swedish surgeon, and he moved to Switzerland to lower his taxes. And, you know, like everybody does. And uh, so here was this famous person there, and he became a patron to Andreas Grunzig. Not a financial patron, but Grunzig's problem was where was he going to get cases to do? Because there are other surgeons who didn't want them to do cases that they could do. And this guy said, let him do it. And it happened. Sun shines, moon reflects. That's the way things, things work. Now, that was, that was luck. Uh, this was even more luck. All of you could wish that you have something like this happen. It turns out in 1980, Johnny Carson, the famous night show uh, comedian uh, with an audience of 20 million plus, had intermittent claudication in the leg, meaning that he could only walk about 100 feet until the pain was excruciating. But Johnny was a golfer. He started off every, every program by swinging an imaginary club. That was his thing. If he couldn't play golf, he'd rather be dead. But he was in Hollywood. He went to Cedars Sinai. And he told the audience that he was going to be away for six to nine months, whatever it is, in order to have his leg fixed. And they were going to operate on it. And they told him a little bit about what he was told about the operation. But they said, they're going to try something out on me. They've got a catheter with a balloon on it. And they're going to, before they do the operation, they're going to stick this thing in my leg and try expanding it and see if they can open that narrowing. 
He, he sort of explained it basically simply to that audience of 20 million. He said, if that works, I might be back a bit earlier. Two nights later, he was back. And he had a sidekick named Ed McMahon that he used to have this dialogue with. And he proceeds to explain this whole thing. And the phones on every vascular surgeon in the country started ringing off the hook. Uh, you know, I want one of those balloon jobs. And in fact, I remember giving a talk at the Mass General uh, where we, we talked about these new procedures. And we had some surgeons there because this was the thing you do. And their response was, you know, this sounds like a promising technique, but I look forward to the results in 20 years when we see if it really lasts. You know, uh, they, they got you. So my, my reminder to you guys is the game ain't over when you solve the technical problem. <laughs> and if you've really disrupted, which is great, because we certainly need more disruption. Think about the subtle things and think about what, 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 what Grinzigwig. And you know, when you start something new, one of the challenges you've got is that you've got to uh, explain things to people. You've got to define the field. You've got to set up standards. You've got to be responsible for more than your product. You've got to make sure the field understands the potential for this. You do that, and you begin to own the field, and you get the respect that goes with doing that, where you can be a great salesman, but in fact, you can be a great educator as, as well. I'm going to stop there and just briefly say, last week, I, I, was, I was at a meeting and talked a little bit about disruptive technology at uh, a big cardiology event. And uh, it was rather fascinating. One of the doctors there has written a history that's rather extraordinary uh, called The Heart Healers. And uh, it's about the pioneers who changed the field. The idea of touching the heart didn't exist in the late 50s. And a few docs, a few surgeons, uh, uh, C. Walton Lillehigh in Minnesota, Dwight Harkin in Boston, uh, they took that risk. They got roundly criticized, and in some ways <laughs> they deserved it. But my appreciation goes out to the risk taker and the person who is convinced and wants to get things done. And that's what you're doing. So uh, thank you, and good luck to all of you. Thank you. Now we're going to hear from our illustrious judges who have taken the time out to be here. So each judge is going to stand up and introduce himself and tell him tell everyone a little bit about himself. Rob Faulkner. Uh, I'm with Red Mile Group. We're a healthcare investment firm based in San Francisco. We run about $2 billion. Uh, we have about uh, 500 million of that invested in private companies. So we uh, go across all, all spectrums. Uh, I'm thrilled to be here and see uh, six really well-refined uh, uh, finalists. Uh, I've done a number of these, and uh, it's a good group. So uh, thanks for having me. Evening, everybody. David Fagan. I'm with Boston Scientific. I'm responsible for digital health. Uh, please don't ask me what that means exactly, but <laughs> but I'm absolutely thrilled to be here. Unbelievable cater of of companies. I was fortunate enough to review the entire list, and it was actually quite a challenge to come up. And and you know there are many more than just six, um, but. I believe that with the transformation of healthcare, with the engagement of consumers, digital health is absolutely at the core of what's going to solve a lot of our health system inefficiencies, a lot of the challenges, resolve the hassles, connect. And I'm absolutely thrilled to, for Boston Scientific, so thank you, sir, in particular, uh, thrilled to be helping to drive that change. So thank you. Excuse me. Hi. My name is Howard Levin. I'm an engineer turned heart failure cardiologist turned startup guy. 
and um, now the uh, president and chief scientific officer of an uh, idea generator incubator called Caridia. We've uh, done a number of projects over the years from cardiovascular to pulmonary to renal. And one of the core things that we never had the opportunity to do was to be able to integrate all the information that we got from near and far uh, in being able to uh, tie our therapies to diagnostics to the treatment of patients. So I'm actually, this first time I'm here, I'm very interested and very excited to hear more about the great projects that uh, have been, are being presented today. Thanks. Hi, I'm Darshak Sanghavi. I'm the Chief Medical Officer at Optum Labs, part of a United Health Group. We look at all kinds of interesting problems, uh, everything from opiate use disorder to hepatitis C to, um, to Alzheimer's disease in a variety of interesting innovative areas. Um, before joining Optum Labs, I was in the Obama administration as the Director of Prevention and Population Health at Medicare and Medicaid, coming up with large payment model changes for the country. Um, and before that, I was a fellow and managing director at the Brookings Institution, a nonpartisan think tank in Washington. And I'm, by background, a pediatric cardiologist trained right here in Boston, where I actually still see patients every now and then. <laughs> Hi, I'm Josh Mandel. I'm a physician and a software developer, and I work at Verily in the building here. Uh, before I came to Verily, I was at Harvard Medical School working on technology to make it easier to plug apps and services into electronic health records and promoting consumer access to um, one's own records. Really excited to be here tonight. <laughs> I'm Chris Coburn. I'm del <clears throat> delighted to be back with Jennifer and crew uh, as a judge again. It, it is a great night, and it's a real pr uh, privilege to be here. I also want to acknowledge my colleague, Joe Kaviter, one of the real pioneers of the connected health industry. There he is, Joe. Uh, and just say, uh, you know, we're Partners Healthcare. We're the largest academic research enterprise in the business, about $1.6 billion a year in research, 3,500 faculty. But uh, information technology probably represents, I would say, more, almost 60% of everything we're working on relative to new applications. So this is right, and we're working with a lot of the companies that are here, especially Boston Scientific. I hope everyone will come to our, uh, our innovation forum in early May on cardiovascular, and I just want to acknowledge the co-chair of that, Callum McCray, received a $75 million grant from Google Verily for his new innovative work in combining information technology uh, and related to cardiac care, cardiovascular care. So thank you. Great. Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful group of judges. So we're going to move into the presentations that I know you've all been waiting for. Uh, we have six finalists. They're going to have seven minutes to present and then since seven minutes to answer questions from our illustrious judges here. Um, and we're going to get started. I bet you didn't know that Jim Ryan here, uh, before he was an MC here in Boston, he was a radio DJ in Japan. Jim, will you be using your radio voice to announce people tonight? My radio voice. <laughs> mm, OK, I'll give it a shot. <clears throat> <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> please put your hands together in a warm round of applause, welcoming our team from all the way across the river in Boston. Medumo, an automated patient engagement platform. Uh, hi, good evening, everyone. My name is Omar Badri, and I'm a resident in the Harvard system, as well as one of the co-founders of Medumo. Before getting started, I wanted to uh, thank the folks at Google, uh, Boston Scientific, as well as Modestro for putting on this competition and inviting us. <clears throat> so I want to get started by just kind of uh, discussing what led me and my co-founders, who are also physicians, to d develop Medumo. Uh, we found ourselves being increasingly frustrated by the lack of instructions and guidance that patients were getting before they were undergoing procedures. We felt like uh, that lack of information actually resulted in inferior outcomes and lots of issues in their care. Uh, I think over time, after trying to find solutions, we figured out there, there weren't any, and that was part of the reason why they got such poor care. And so our goal was to develop a efficient, effective, and cost-affordable technology solution 
that would allow providers to automatically touch base with their patients and instruct them and let them know what they need to do. And one of the centerpieces really kind of focused on using data that was being generated to improve the entire process. So I want to focus just on colonoscopies for a minute and use that as the example by which we can kind of discuss all procedures and how uh, the technology we've developed kind of applies to that. So colonoscopy is a procedure that is very dependent on the preparation process. Uh, patients have to change their diet as well as take medications beforehand in order to have a successful outcome. Unfortunately, as easy as this sounds, 7 to 12 percent of patients actually either fail the entire preparation process, don't show up, or cancel so late that they can't actually backfill the slot. And then what complicates the problem is that 25 percent of patients who do show up actually have an inadequate prep, meaning that the endoscopist goes in and can't actually really see what's going on all too well, and they need to have a repeat procedure. So the financial implications of this are actually quite massive. So for an average group of endoscopists doing 18,000 procedures a year, um, using kind of the, the lower level of 7% failure rate, what you find is that they miss out on about 1,300 slots. And using some internal costing data at a number of hospitals, each one of these slots actually has a bottom line financial impact of about $1,400. So if you total that up, that's about $1.7 million. And so if you look here, now zooming out, colonoscopy is just a tiny little fraction of the entire kind of uh, market. And so there's 15 million colonoscopies a year, there's 50 million outpatient procedures, and there's 130 million procedures total in the US annually. And that's just procedures. That's not the other use cases uh, for which this technology can be applied. So the technology itself involves the uh, institution or group of providers setting a series of messages um, according to a timeline that's timed to the actual procedure date itself. And essentially, at each point, they either receive a video, a checklist, or some sort of standardized question that allows the provider to check in with the patient and that the software can kind of read and validate automatically. So what you see here in the screenshot is uh, the patient, we don't do any app downloads. We actually run the entire thing using text messages and email because we found that that actually re results in much higher levels of engagement. So what you see there is a text message that the, that the patient receives. They get a, a brief, brief blurb about you know, what the message may entail. And then if they click on the link, it either on the left leads to a standardized question um, that's kind of predetermined by the provider. Or on the right, they may receive a video or some form of checklist that helps them prepare and determine what they need to do on that particular day. So I was going to just show you a brief video about how this works. So you can see there, you can kind of get the flow of how we kind of time the messages according to when the messenger, messages are actually relevant. So if we circle back on this notion of data, we really keep track of every single touch point, how the patients are interacting, how much time is being spent, what type of responses they're putting in, and then we really kind of limit the number of structured questions to just one, two, as, as few as possible. So we really try to filter out the signal to noise. And depending on how the patient interacts and responds, we can kind of determine what their risk of actually being ready and showing up is. We've done this kind of over time by uh, beginning to um, coordinate and validate what the responses are with the clinical outcomes. And so we ran an initial trial at a safety net hospital here in the Boston area. We had about 40 patients that were enrolled in Meduma. We had about 40 patients who were controls. What we found, that we 95% activation, 90% of patients remained engaged throughout the process. We had a massive reduction in the late no-show rate. That number for that hospital was 27% beforehand. With implementation of our software, we dropped it to just under nine. 95% of patients showed up with an adequate prep, and we're working on ways to push that to um, as, as, great as, as good as possible. Then our net promoter score was 9.3. And you can see there some of the testimonials from the patients as well as the nurses. And on the bottom, some of the institutions that we're working with. 
So briefly, the price is between $3 and $7 per patient who uses the software, and the pricing really just varies depending on the type of features that are being utilized. And then briefly, before I conclude, just want to touch a little bit about the kind of go-to-market as well as our competitive advantage. We're working with just a handful of providers now. But we hope to reach out to, you know, all 11,000 hospitals and advanced surgical centers. Um, you know, we're really interested in performance-based pricing. You know, we're not happy unless our customers are happy. We're in it to solve the problem. Regarding the, um, <coughs> excuse me, uh, competitive advantage, we focus on the clinical data. I think, uh, you know, having, in addition to this trial, we're running a large 10,000 patient cohort trial. And using that data, we've really been able to win over a lot of providers. And finally, we're really focused on uh, refining our predictive algorithms. Finally, I want to just uh, conclude by thanking the team. Without, that, without them, nothing would be possible. A couple of them are here, and so thank you uh, for your support. And with that, I'll conclude. If you're interested in trying a demo, you can just text Medumo to that number there, and you'll kind of get a sense of how the software works. Um, feel free to reach out to me via email, and I'm happy to take any questions. So we have seven minutes for questions from the judges. You can start. Yes. So um, I have two questions. The first is that, um, Sending text messages is, is, uh, is a fairly basic intervention. It's not necessarily patentable. Uh, other people can send text messages. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on what is a barrier to entry for other uh, companies that can do this. There are numerous competitors that have similar concept models. The second is that you raised the, the, um, the case example of colonoscopy. As you know, colonoscopy is probably going to be displaced by other forms of non-invasive testing that are far more convenient for patients. What are the other use cases for which you think you can dramatically sort of improve uh, outcomes with this technology? Thank you for your questions. Uh, I'll start with the second one. Um, you know, we think that there's a host of applications, uh, areas where we've, we've received a lot of interest, um, has to do with total hip and total knee replacements, especially as we've moved away from fee for service towards bundled payments. That pressure to kind of make sure patients are ready and having great outcomes is still very much there, um, independent of the payment model. Um, things like ostomy creation, feeding tubes. We've had a lot of interest in GI with patients who are on Harvoni, short courses of medications that really require a high degree of adherence. Um, we've had a number of pediatrics groups reach out to us. So I think that um, there's a lot of different use cases. And I think uh, what's great about the software is we allow the providers to kind of go onto the platform and build their own kind of series of messaging, you know, for their own use cases. So we're really interested in building the tools. Um, to circle back to your first question with a competitive advantage, I think, you know, we've really focused on uh, two pieces. Um, you know, we think of ourselves as more than just kind of text messaging and email. Uh, we really try to use that piece of streamlining the entire process for the provider by allowing them to generate their, you know, their own contents. Um, we really kind of focus on the clinical data so that people, we can validate the tools that we're creating and the techniques and the methods. And then we really do focus on building the kind of the predictive algorithm engines in terms in terms of trying to determine over time, you know, who's, who's at likelihood of failure. And we think that kind of is something that we're going to continue to focus on and develop to hopefully keep people out from just copycatting and sending messages. <coughs> Excuse me. So how do you make your investors money? I'm still following up on his question here. I'm just trying to understand, you know, okay, fine, seven bucks a, a, a patient, that's fine. But the, the thing is, how are you going to make your investors who invest in this as opposed to the next person, again, who comes? Uh, you know, I, I don't see any protection here, per se. And without protection, IP or other or some secret sauce or trade secret, you're not going to be able to uh, get your investors' return. I, you know, I, uh, I appreciate the question. I think it's a, it's a very valid concern. Um, you know, I, I think we, you know, you can, I, in some ways you can only protect so much without, you know, a patent or some sort of trade secret, as you alluded to. Um, you know, f for us, I think building a tool that is incredibly easy to use on the, on the provider side works with their workflow, can, it's been validated using research. So you've done something good for mankind, mm -hmm. which is, in itself is very important and laudable. But again, why would I invest in you? Well, I think there's a lot of people out there in the engagement space. Um, you know, a, a lot of them are doing uh, lots of different things. Um, you know, I think we're going about it in a slightly different way. Um, and I think that as we kind of gain customers, they put their content onto our platform. 
we have you know lots of research to kind of validate the things that we're doing. We build these analytics engines that other people just don't have. They can't predict when patients are going to have issues. I think those are all things that you you know either take time to develop and lots of research, um, and are things that you can't necessarily just enter the market and do. And one last question, unrelated to what I just asked you. So the average type of procedure, except for the pediatric stuff you alluded might be there, most of these patients tend to be on the older side. And what makes you think that, you know, when you get into the older age group, the Medicare age group, that they're actually going to deal with your texting and other things? Do you have any data or any testing to show that it's not like a 55 and below type people who actually have most of smartphones and really care. I mean, my mother wouldn't use this. Right. No, and I think that was one of the legitimate concerns is, as you know, healthcare, especially a lot of the very costly stuff, tends to be done with older patients. We've really kind of approached that in two ways. One, and some of our early trials as well as additional data that we've generated um, at a number of different hospitals actually shown that patients, even up to the age of 80, for the most part have been very engaged in the software. And a lot of times actually spend a lot of time. They want to know what's going on. And they're kind of plugged into their devices, surprisingly. Um, and the second piece is what we do is we actually co-register a caregiver with them that receives the identical messages. And that way, that a lot of times can kind of help drive adherence when you know, the, the child or the, the primary caregiver can help them remember what they need to do because a lot of times they're just as frustrated and want to know what to do but don't know what to do. <laughs> More questions. Josh, I think. Sure. So you gave us a really clear sense of what the patient or the caregiver experience is like. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about what the setup is like on the provider side, both to register an individual, uh, but also to, I suppose, to enter in outcomes so that you can actually begin to learn and predict? Absolutely. So um, for us, the actual registration process is initially done kind of manually by um, them sending over the, the scheduling information as well as patient uh, contact information. We're actually in the process of automating it um, at a number of institutions where we automatically pull the scheduling information and contact information and it gets on to us using an SFTP and we auto enroll all the patients. So for the provider, they kind of set the content the messages kind of go out automatically. There's no disruption of workflow. We, we check in with patients, and only when there's an issue do we actually kind of send it back to the provider and say, hey, you know, this is something that you need to intervene on. So we really try to minimize the signal-to-noise ratio. As a provider, you know, I can't tell you how frustrating it is to open up your Epic InBasket or your email box and just have, you know, hundreds of messages, and I can't imagine opening it up and having another 1,000 or 2,000 different data points. Um, and then on the, 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 the second part of that question was how the providers interact with the software itself. To track the outcomes of interest. To track their outcomes, right. Um, so uh, what we do is actually we just email them back if we determine someone is at high risk. Um, and so we drop it in their email box using their existing. But, so let's say it's a high risk of having an inadequate prep. How do you know who actually had an, an, an inadequate prep? Right. So uh, during uh, a lot of our trials, we actually correlate the um, engagement with the software as well as what their end outcomes were with like the Boston uh, prep scale as well as like um, whether adenomas are picked up, whether they showed up on time, other things. And so over time we can we can model that. Uh, the hope is that as we connect in with other hospitals, we're able to kind of continuously refine that um, using uh, programming techniques. And one last question from Rob. Uh, maybe back uh, to competition in, in the tech world often, you know, there's a dominant winner independent of, kind of IP or the like mm -hmm. because something becomes a standard. Um, can, do you have a sense, can you share a sense of where you stand on key adoption criteria like ease of use or value at yeah. other ways versus competition? Absolutely. Um, you know, just looking at the, the, the return on investment, um, you know, with the institution that we're working with in our initial trial, we dropped our no-show rate by 60%. I mean, it was massive. Mm -hmm. um, and so they were able to actually fill it, not waste slots, and be able to recruit a, a lot of, you know, missed revenue opportunities. So for them, their ROI was, like, enormous based off of what we were actually charging. Because I'm thinking in terms of versus competition, if you know of your competition. Um, I, I, do know, I do know the competition quite well. Uh, we've had, had a lot of actually, once we start working in hospitals, what we've seen is a lot of other physicians and other specialties and other groups have actually contacted us and say, actually, we're really interested in this use case. We'd like to see if you can kind of help us with this particular issue, whether it's cardiac, uh, 
stress testing or it's uh, anesthesia. And so we've actually seen providers talking about their experience and drawing on other providers in different fields. So I think that at, at least as a softer metric kind of speaks to you know, the, the usability and value of the product. Thanks. Great, big round of applause. There was manual work involved. Yeah. All right. For the, uh, the slide to get queued up here. Guys. Oh. Ah. No. <laughs> All right. We're ready to go? Okay. Uh, wait a minute. My script is out of order. Oh, no. You guys, you guys have a new name now. Sorry. Um, so originally, this team uh, was called Stop CKD because uh, they want to stop CKD. Great. Um, and that's correct, right? Yes. Uh, and they have uh, come up with the name Dive Health, um, which they'll explain to you why it's that. But back to my radio announcer voice. <clears throat> Let's hear a warm round of applause for our next team, all the way from Duke University, Matt Sendak and Faraz Yashar from Dive Health. <laughs> Hello, everybody. My name is Mark, and I'm here and excited to tell you about Dive Health, which is supported by Duke Health and the Duke Institute for Health Innovation. We're in the midst of a shift from fee-for-service to value-based payments. So we have these organizations now called accountable care organizations that lose money from preventable complications. And often the data that you would need to prevent the complication is locked away in electronic health records. Kidney disease is a perfect example. Every year, about 120,000 patients across the country newly develop end-stage kidney disease, costing our healthcare system over $11 billion. The worst part of this is that we have really good models for identifying high-risk patients, and they rely on a handful of structured data, data elements in the health record. You would think that bringing models and data together is a problem technology can solve. But typical health IT solutions are a nightmare. They require you to overhaul your IT systems, send staff for training, take years to implement, and you're ultimately never sure if you're gonna get a return on your investment. That's why we built Droplet. These are simple, cheap, use validated models, agnostic to data source, and secure. Our first Droplet is Stop CKD, Stop Chronic Kidney Disease. Download our desktop, desktop app, take data pulled from your electronic health record and claims, drag and drop it onto the app, and we do all the data processing, validation, and modeling, and provide you an interactive report of your high-risk kidney disease patients. You can hand this to a care manager to make appointments to see a specialist. We piloted this at Duke's Medicare Accountable Care Organization, and over a period of 10 months, identified 84 patients for referral to see a kidney specialist. And the best part was that using our interactive report, it took the team only two minutes, a little more than two minutes, to review each case and decide whether or not a change in management was required. If you could scale this to all Medicare accountable care organizations, you could save up to $1.8 billion. If you prevent only 20% of complications, you save $360 million. This is where Dive Health comes in. If our analytic enables you to achieve these savings and we capture 15% of the savings, it generates 54 million in revenue. This is where the talk would end if we were a kidney disease company, but we're not. We're a data company and we're trying to unlock the value of healthcare data to drive clinical decisions across this spectrum. What we're trying to do is build a platform that's open to machine learning model developers. It's a distribution channel for models. The more models you have on the platform, the more valuable the platform is to a healthcare system. The more healthcare systems you have using the platform, the more rapidly we can validate models to deploy a new model for a new customer. And this market is growing. More patients are enrolling in these plans that are partnerships between payers and providers, and this is driving technology investment. But unfortunately, this is what the landscape currently looks like. The vast majority of products are in the bottom left. These are closed, customized solutions. You can develop an application on one Epic implementation that does not port over to the next. In the bottom right, these are proprietary models that can integrate with different electronic health record 
vendors, but there's no place for that brilliant model developer sitting next to you to, to put content. In today's world, the dream for a model developer is to get put on MD Calc, where a physician at the point of care will manually enter in the predictor variables. Dive Health is the first scalable solution for machine learning in healthcare. So we generate revenue through both subscription fees and through capturing 15% of savings. If you extend our work from kidney disease to a handful of other chronic conditions and inpatient complications, revenue growth is exponential. And we embrace revenue sharing agreements like other marketplaces that you're familiar with, app stores, so we keep 30% of revenue and 70% goes back to model developers. We started at Duke, but are looking to grow, both in terms of model development and healthcare systems. And we know what we're up against. The CIOs who we've talked to have said, we don't want a solution for a single disease. That's why we pivoted to a platform. We need to be providing insight for all sorts of chronic conditions. We've all heard that healthcare providers won't change practice patterns for one new piece of information. That's why we work at the system level to optimize referrals and get the right patient in front of the provider. And lastly, we've all heard that the big vendors in this space are gonna solve this problem. They're building web services and open platforms to do modeling. But it may take a year or two to validate and publish a model, a few years for it to gain clinical adoption, and then a year or two to implement it into your health record. Healthcare will stay decades behind in terms of technology adoption, unless if you interface directly with machine learning model developers. And that's our competitive advantage. We have an open platform that was designed by and for developers, easy to use for developers. We have successful pilots at Duke with kidney disease. We've started diabetes, heart failure, sepsis. And we've worked with the NIH to write the business case for why you should use healthcare information technology to treat kidney disease. It's a privilege to represent my team. And I hope you all enjoy the evening. Thank you. Great, thank you. There is um, solving this, right, uh, patient risk stratification, identifying patients at risk, um, and, and ubiquitous normalized data that algorithms can sit on is, is you know, it's, it's sort of a holy grail. So my question is really twofold. One, you, you do have Apravita, they were a competitor, right? They're gonna largely commoditize algorithms or at least create a very efficient market for them and the challenge i would say they're probably facing although i don't know exactly is this last mile challenge right i got the algorithm but how do i integrate and that problem is always kind of goes back to that data problem so are you are you basically saying that you've cracked it I would love to, but I'm telling you that we've done it at Duke. So I would say the secret sauce. So for I'm a med student with a bachelor's in math. For the last three, four years, I've been working as a data janitor. So chronic kidney disease progresses over five, 10 years. So Duke has only been on Epic since 2013. We had all scripts before and then a homegrown system. So I had to harmonize kidney disease labs over 10 years, three different systems. So we had a, a lot of effort went into thinking and very closely with our specialty specialist colleagues, how do we know that this is a serum creatinine? And how do we know that it's valid? And I learned so much, like because there's this assay called Jaffe that I had never even heard of, but different periods of time, there's new lab, labs start coming in looking a little bit different. So we had to come in with these validators and cleaners. And so our next challenge, and we're hoping to do this with the NIH again, we're part of the working group around health IT, is to validate a CKD computable phenotype on three different health systems data. So at Duke, we did this on, there were about 3 million serum creatinine values, and now we're gonna start seeing data from so, across the country. So I, again, that's, that's kind of what maybe what I thought, and, and, but that's a very linear and, and really intense resource ramp, and there are players, Explorers or IBM Watson now, who have been on that ramp and journey kind of more broadly for years. So again, kind of go back. Yeah. What's, why do you think you're gonna get ahead and, and create you know, some kind of exponential curve there? 
by making it open. So I would say we are crowdsourcing, validating your own data. So let's say a group in Minnesota wants to do this. I can't tell you how the labs in Minnesota are gonna send the data to that specific healthcare provider. So think of Wikipedia, each site can contribute their own validators and say, labs that are tagged with these pieces of <coughs> metadata are in <coughs> But as the repository of these validators grows, a new institution can run all of them and see how their specific data responds to these different definitions of validity from across the country. So I, I honestly don't think that one company can crack this because data is so messy. Everyone who creates data can do what they want, like extra spaces in the lab name. So. You can say maybe some algorithms can just classify labs, maybe we'll get there, but many lab values have the same normal range. Like, I don't know how you would do that. So, talking about explorers, so if you look at going for customer two through six for them that really made the company, t talk about the practical aspects of how you're going to broaden the community where the model is you know, DOA without that. Yeah, so we started with an ACO, and I know that we're in a very tenuous time with changes in the political environment, but um, we were a, a success for MSSPs for managing chronic kidney disease. We were featured in a webinar with CMS back in the fall. We worked closely with Mark McClellan, who's at Duke now. He helps lead the Accountable Care Learning Co Collaborative. So I think first is working with other accountable care organizations. Because to be honest, for, for kidney disease, even though the MSSP at Duke is incentivized to prevent dialysis, the rest of Duke may not be. So that's why we wanna start working with these other disease states. Preventing sepsis is something every hospital is trying to do. And right now the, the model we're building for that is a deep learning model with neural networks and we are still figuring out how to build the web service to pull data out of Epic. but. I think that the types of models that we're starting to be able to integrate is is a competitive advantage as well. I want to see if I understood the drag and drop paradigm that you described before. Was that a paradigm at, you know, when a clinician actually wants to run a model on a given patient, they would go into the EHR and navigate to the data and, and copy it out? And the, the reason I ask the question this way is usually the data you would need to run a model like that is fragmented and split across many, maybe dozens of screens in the system. Yeah, so um, we actually had this, this problem when we were dealing with the MSSP at Duke was that the data was so fragmented. And one of the solutions we proposed was actually creating a service that would read out of the EHR and write back in. And you have to imagine that the political hurdles for something like that are enormous. So the solution we came up with was building an application that effectively just takes raw dumps. So you dump data in, we run through a series of validators that run like very simple statistical models to just guess at where does, data doesn't be, where does, where does, the, where does this data belong. And then we run that through the regressions, and then we provide the report to um, the providers so that they can look at everything. So the idea was, how can we eliminate all of the bureaucratic friction between the solution that we've come up with and actually implementing it and having it work at the hospital? And security, building a web application that hosts this and getting people, like Duke is just starting to, to agree to put data on the cloud. So. It, it, this avoids that, just saying download it to whatever laptop you have, and then you can run this locally. Yeah, so these are again just extracts. Yeah, like, but the assumption is you work with your business analyst to run a query, a SQL query, to pull data out. So that's what the individual files were in that image. Great, thank you. Dive Health. All right, uh, who do we have up next on the docket? It looks like we have our next team representing Tuio Health. Let's have a warm round of applause for Dr. Michael Karsha. Uh, 
Uh, hi, my name is Mike Karsha. I'm the CTO of Tuyo Health. Tuyo in Latin means to care for, or to protect. Uh, and uh, for the last two years, we've been developing a uh, fundamental change in how we care for kids with asthma. So asthma, asthma is both common and costly. There's 7 million kids in the United States with asthma, of which accounts for over $6 billion in direct medical expenditures. However, there's a big problem in asthma, which is that 50% of patients are not well controlled. So why is this? Well, unfortunately, asthma management relies heavily, almost entirely, on patient self-reported assessment of symptoms. That is, we simply ask the patient, how are they doing? Um, this leads to uh, a lot of inconsistent and it's subjective uh, and ultimately poor patient adherence to medication. So contrast this to diabetes, which has a glucometer, uh, hemoglobin A1C, and ultimately these tools give you a number, a number that you can track and trend over time and see how you're doing. So which would you rather have? Uh, a subjective measure that's inconsistent um, and leaves families wondering and a provider may obtain every couple of months? Or would you rather have an objective measure that's a daily, uh, daily measure um, that really empowers families to manage this chronic disease? So this is exactly what Tuyo Health is, is uh, providing. Uh, and the way we do this is that we look at both the inputs of asthma control, that is uh, the, the, the items shown on the left here. Uh, you can imagine there's a number of data sets out there to leverage that. Um, and then more importantly, we look at the outputs of asthma control, that is the signs and symptoms coming off the patient. Uh, we do this with a sensor that I'll, that I'll talk more about, and we use that to compute uh, the asthma metric. So uh, there's four components to our solution. Uh, there's the, the passive nocturnal sensor that we attach to the mattress that has Wi-Fi and it sends data to us uh, that we then have personal analytics in the cloud that compute on this, compute the score, compute other metrics. We provide that data to the patient in the form of a mobile app. Uh, they can use that to contextualize the changes in the data in their daily life. So maybe exposures, uh, other triggers that are out there, they can connect the dots. And then data alone is not enough to get an, a clinical outcome. So in addition to this, we provide alerts when we, when we detect uh, changes in the data. Uh, and then along, alerts to the family, uh, along with targeted behavioral guidance and education. So the way this works is uh, shown graphically here. Um, so the top line is uh, meant to represent a patient's control. Um, and as we see a change in the wrong direction of that control, we eventually reach out with an alert, uh, first automated through the app, and then eventually uh, through an asthma educator, which is uh, another provider that's part of the asthma ecosystem. Uh, and they will ask questions, get more context, perhaps provide education around using asthma inhaler, uh, and steer that patient in the right direction uh, towards the bottom line of, of improved control. Uh, there's a clear value proposi proposition here to payers. Uh, a patient with uncontrolled asthma costs uh, payers $4,000 a year more than a patient with well-controlled asthma. So I mentioned the sensor, um, where it's a, a device that you attach to the bed. Um, and one of the things I wanted to mention here is that the device is passive. Once you install it, you can forget about it. Um, and we thought this was critical in our solution. There's a lot of talk of wearables and, and other things out there. Uh, and that really involves patient involvement. And we think we'll have adherence issues over time. So uh, initially, we built our own sensor. Uh, since then, uh, commercial sensors have come on the market. So we're using this device from Marada. It's essentially an accelerometer attached to a Wi-Fi module. And uh, we then, uh, using a technique called ballistocardiography, which has actually been around since the early 1900s, um, the idea is that uh, when the heart beats, there's a small vibration in the body. That body's transmitted to the mattress, and we can detect that in the mattress. From that heart beat, we can get heart rate, heart rate variability, respiratory rate, uh, and a variety of other metrics, even uh, a relative measure of stroke volume of the heart. So uh, we've been running a, uh, through a translational grant, we've been running an observational study for the last year. Uh, we've collected a tremendous amount of data that's helped build our algorithm and analytics. Uh, to give you an idea of how much data we're collecting, we collect about 300,000 samples per patient per night. So you can see this turns into a, a very large data set rapidly. Now, this study will be wrapping up next month, in which, we'll, in which case we'll do a full uh, analysis of the data and leading to a peer-reviewed journal publication. We've had two preliminary uh, analysis of the data that have uh, yielded uh, abstracts, the first showing that uh, there are heart, the heart rate changes precede exacerbations by days, and the second uh, showing that these heart rate changes do, in fact, correlate with asthma control. 
so here's an example of a patient from our study. Um, we're showing the median heart rate here, so just a single data point for each night, so we've sort of simplified it a good bit. But you can see very clearly there's a, a trend upwards days and weeks before this ultimate exacerbation uh, in mid-November. You can also see that um, that with uh, proper treatment and medication, the patient quickly recovers um, and, um, uh, and actually returns to the, to, to the baseline, which we predicted for them in the first case. Now, here's another patient. This time, we're showing the Tuyo score, which we keep uh, proprietary. Um, but you can see the score ranges from 0 to 100. And on two instances, we internally noted that there should be alerts for this patient. Uh, when we followed up with the parents, um, they did, in fact, confirm that uh, these alerts would have preceded symptoms by about one to three days. It's often even more than this. Um, but the reason I'm showing this particular patient is that this was a very observant mom. Um, and look what happens next. So uh, with this particular patient, uh, on the third time that this patient had symptoms, the mother was unable to determine or ascertain that this was really a fundamentally different event than it had occurred previously, uh, and ultimately it resulted in an ER visit uh, in late January. And when we followed up with the mom afterwards, she commented in retrospect that had she understood that this was fundamentally different, uh, she would have used uh, the rescue inhaler that her daughter often uses uh, on a more lengthy basis to return to control. And contrast all of this to, uh, this is a patient who's well controlled in our study, and it's quite striking. Uh, and this what's, what's very exciting why we're working on this, uh, what, what gets me up in the morning. So uh, we have a great team, uh, Bronwyn, pediatric cardiologists, um, and Todd, who has a lot of engineering and manufacturing experience myself. Um, and uh, we're excited for this opportunity to work with Boston Scientific. And um, I'll close with a quote from our CEO's daughter, who was recently diagnosed with asthma. Thank you very much. So um, uh, at CM CMS, as you're probably aware, spent tens of millions of dollars studying various types of asthma interventions across the country and failed to demonstrate significant impact on total cost of care. It's one of the reasons why home visits are generally not covered by most Medicaid and other commercial insurers these days. One thing I was just interested to find out is if you could just draw the path between the very early technology here and potential actual impact on meaningful total cost of care and why this would be more successful where others have failed. And the second question I'd ask is that, um, as you're probably aware, uh, places like Cambridge Health Alliance locally here have eliminated hospitalizations that are avoidable among children, not with a fancy tech application, but simply with community health workers actually instructing people on how to properly use preventable, to use their controller medication and, and inhalers. Again, that's a high-touch human intervention rather than sort of a high-tech sort of um, smartphone app-based intervention, which targets a very different demographic. Can you sort of talk about why we should invest in something like this rather than something that's proven to work that's far cheaper? Yeah. Well, um, so it's a great question. And uh, I'll point out a couple of things. Uh, the latter first is, um, so education is, you know, proven to work. Um, and uh, actually, you know, we're, for as a business model, we're targeting sort of the integrated health networks of the world and, you know, CMS you mentioned. Um, and uh, it's important to note so that in, in California, for instance, Kaiser is already employing asthma educators to, um, to, to reach out to you know, the, the, the patients and the families who have the worst control and work with them directly, a very similar example. Um, so one way you can kind of view this is sort of an optimization of, of that process. You know, they have this pain point of they're hiring these educators, uh, and we can very closely and early tell them you know, who, who's heading in the wrong direction, where should you be expending your energy and, and your money. Um, so it's sort of a different take on the approach, but uh, I think resonates with, you know, with, with the healthcare network. Um, and then uh, for the, the latter part, or the former part, um, if I heard the, correct, the question correctly, um, you know, the, the industry's focused on these exacerbations are clearly the most uh, cost, uh, cost incurring part. Um, and we think that, you know, merely predicting the exacerbation is not enough. And so that, uh, that quantitative control mixed with education, uh, we believe would make a very big difference in keeping those patients from even ever getting close to coming to the ER. Um, and so uh, that would translate into a, a very real and significant um, cost improvement. 
I wonder if you could talk about how down the road you would extract value, dollar cash value type from whomever to, to drive the business. Gotcha. Um, so down the road being ultimate business model or, right. yeah. So, uh, we are, um, so the, you know, the, the big money we think is, is, is with the integrated health networks. Mm -hmm. Um, so our strategy right now is we're doing this observational study. We'll then we're doing an uh, interventional study, um, and, uh, working towards pilots and ultimately contracts with these health networks. Um, so uh, in addition, I'll point out that uh, we've had a lot of early interest from the consumer market, um, which we tread lightly on, um, but through, uh, to, so for early adopters. So we've sort of been toying with this idea initially of sort of a limited consumer launch. There's some pros and cons to this, but building more, getting more data, really refining the process, uh, and even demonstrating more to these health networks. So this is a viable and valuable approach. Um, but the ultimate and the the the, the true goal is, um, is is for the payers and for the health networks. And um, our goal, right? We just closed C funding um, in the last few days, actually. Um, and our goal is to be uh, achieving these pilots in, at the so end of this year. In your vision, the health, the health network is paying a monthly fee over many, many years to keep these patients from entering the system, from accessing the system. For uh, on a per patient basis and uh, to, to minimize their costs of managing these patients over time. Yeah. So, so two questions. One is, <coughs> excuse me, one is, you know, th this is a problem of different socioeconomic groups, and what makes you believe that the socioeconomic group that has the most problems, probably the lower socioeconomic right. group, is going to use this device? Number two is, let's say you're wildly successful and you're able to do what you say you do. Could you give me a little bit of flavor behind why you chose the particular measurement that you have, which, from the engineering point of view, I, I think is a really sort of sketchy measurement. I mean, I have no idea I mean, whether you're just acquiring noise and it, the noise happens to correlate to what you're doing or whether there's some, you know, physiological reality you believe that, you know, that is what, uh, you know, actually drives it. For example, have you ever correlated heart rate by an independent measure to the heart rate you purport to measure from your device? Uh, correct. So we we uh, have uh, demonstrated the accuracy of the device. Part of the plan is to get initial FDA clearance on the accuracy of the device as well. Um, you know, there's uh, the I'll say that it's you know extremely accurate within five percent of, of 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 reality of EKG, and um, uh, yeah. I mean, I'm not sure how else to. Um, Address that. I mean, it, it is a viable and functional technology. Uh, we t we uh, measure data throughout the entire eight but, hours of sleep. So, and, so let's, but let's and, say it's it turns out to be really good. Now, how do you actually? What else is there? And have you protected against other things that other competitors come in once you've made the market and shown this is a big problem? Well, so there's a. Uh, a substantial amount of signal processing that goes involved here. So there's uh, a lot, a lot of intellectual property. We believe. Right, but instead of BCG, maybe you know, maybe they use XYZ. Correct. Right? Sure. How do you know that BCG is better than XYZ? And have you patented and looked at all the other things to sort of protect yourself around that that area? Right. Uh, so we do have a patent on uh, a method of, of asthma, uh, asthma correlation and asthma prediction, or not prediction, but measurement. Um, you know, you could use other other uh, techniques of getting some of the variables. You know, I mentioned in the particular BCG case, there's signal processing there. Uh, even once you have the data, um, you know, we're not really quite, we're talking a little bit about a heart rate, but we don't really expose some of the other variables that we measure. Um, and then there's know-how in the actual, once you, how do you take this data and really uh, discern what's happening with the patient. Uh, that's what we've been doing over the last year, and um, that's what uh, a fair amount of literature review has, uh, has gone into. So um, there's multiple layers of sort of the intellectual property here. Great, thank you. To you, have thank a great you. question. All right, we are halfway through our six presentations. Um, 
I just wanted to mention again to the people that are standing at the back, if your legs get a little tired, we have an overflow room where you can sit down and watch. It's just sort of out the door and on the opposite end of the, the room. But uh, we're happy to, to have you stand at the back as well, if, if, if you're OK with that. Um, let's move on to our next uh, presenter. Um, please welcome onto the stage uh, another local team, Michael Shapiro, representing Heartbeats. pleasure and honor to be here in this room. This is a room, uh, to my perception, a room that is full of many dreams, and many dreams that will be impacting our world and already are. Um, so dream well. Um, I'd like to thank the organizers, thank the judges. Uh, I'm going to be talking about heartbeats. Um, rhythm, shape, and beat space. Um, I expect to uh, offer a little bit of evidence that I've brought in some good ideas. I say that in much modesty, as you will soon see. Um, so um, I thought I'd start by telling you what I'm going to tell you about. So I'll be telling you about some previous work, some current work, including our own, and what we think is possible. Um, I want to start by showing you heartbeats. Um, my team member, Eb, likes to see these as signals from the edge of the universe in a Star Trek episode. And truthfully, I think you should look at them and find them a little bit mysterious. You know, they're all sort of periodic with roughly similar frequencies, but the individual waves are very different in shape. Um, the one at the bottom is singing some sort of mysterious song. Um, and here's a heartbeat that seems to be a heart that seems to be waltzing. It's got that one, two, three, one, two, three thing going on. Um, so there's a lot to wonder about what's in there. Um, previous work has focused on heart rate variability, uh, what people call interbeat interval. And on the left, you will see that heartbeats are not the same length from one to the next. And on the right, you can see that there has been a huge uh, industry of papers studying heart rate variability. Um, that last bar is something like uh, 1,500 papers a year coming out. Um, that's a lot of papers. Um, and Heart rate variability has been correlated with numerous uh, clinical conditions, sleep apnea, hypertension, you can look down the list. Sepsis is maybe a little bit surprising. Uh, but yes, many, many things go into this, that, what that heart is doing. And the question is, you know, how are we going to pull it back out? Um, with all of this clinical correlation, it doesn't seem to be something that's used widely in daily clinical practice. Um, so we decided that we wanted to look at the shapes of these heartbeats rather than rhythm. And you can ask yourself, OK, is shape new? Well, the answer is no and yes. Uh, no, in that, you know, whenever a cardiologist looks at an ECG, they're looking at the shapes of the beats. Yes, in the sense that there is very liter little literature that is directly on this topic out there. Uh, we know this one paper by Lou, and uh, we will be returning to this in a moment or so. Um, we decided to take a very naive view of shape. We uh, isolated individual beats. We normalized them for length, 
time length and for total RMS area. And on the left, what you see is the very simple fact that if I take two heartbeats from the same person, in red there, you will see those tend to be more like each other. Their, their distance from each other, if you like, is less than the ones in blue, which are comparisons of heartbeats that come from different hearts. So that says there is something heart-specific about the shape of these beats. On the right, you see clustering of these um, using k-means clustering of the first two principal components of shape. And the clustering is itself highly significant uh, statistically. Now, these seem like very simple results, but to say that a heart has a shape to its beats and that these shapes fall into clusters is exactly what you need to convince yourself that there's a there there. Um, here is a slightly less naive view of these things. Rather than using principal component analysis, we have used TSNE, which is an unsupervised machine learning technique. And lo and behold, yes, it, it finds the individual hearts. You feed it a lot of beats, and the clusters there on the page are individual hearts. And I used colors to call out a small number of the, the hearts in question. So this says that, in principle, yes, there's something to be studied there with machine learning. And I don't think I have to convince this crowd of that. Um, so we think it's time for the big data approach to heartbeat shape. Now, maybe when I wrote this, it has already been time, uh, because the kind of ideas that I'm about to tell you are yeah, time. Well, um, Lou has also come to similar ideas. Uh, we want to map this to beat space. We want to look at where a individual falls in beat space. We want to look at the neighborhood of that person in beat space and see what clinical conditions are enhanced in a person's neighborhood in beat space. Uh, they don't actually even have to walk in the door. Um, seven seconds. Thank you. Well, that's what I want to say. I want to say thank you. Thank you. you know, as, as a cardiologist, I want to <coughs> commend you on some very interesting research. And as a judge, I want to ask you, why in the world would I ever invest in anything like this? <laughs> and <coughs> because I don't, I see... 10 years before you're going to save money for the healthcare system or provide some return on investment to an investor. You know, I could see a lot of theory here, but I, I just, and with, it's not just you, it's a lot of these, and whether my other, other judges can help me on this or whatever, what I see repeatedly with the connected health stuff is, you know, it's all years in the future in the sense that you need large clinical trials to bear out any of this stuff. Why should I pay $7 for, you know, I could see why I should pay $7 for colonoscopy to reduce the number of people who come in. You know, I could see that, you know, if they, they could prove that in a short-term basis. But a lot of these other projects, whether it's this or asthma or other things, I'd just like to get a feel from you how you think it, it should be approached. You know, I, you folks know a lot more. You have a lot more experience than we do as to how these projects develop. But I don't think that this is waiting for large clinical trials because there are big data sets out there like the Framingham Heart Study, which has uh, something like 12,000 people have come through it at this point. So that says you can go ahead and do unsupervised learning on this large pile of heartbeats and then look at the neighborhoods in beat space and say, you know, since you have clinical data in the Framingham Heart Study, you can say, okay, now what is, what is enriched in that region? Uh, so I, I'm speaking here as a completely naive person. But That's I actually a great answer, by the way. 
well, my naivete is 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 a, a quantity that we have generous amounts of. <laughs> uh, but I think it's I get the feeling that my feeling is that it's 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 a lot closer than than you first suggested, just because of the existing data sets. Similar theme, but can you make your insights proprietary? I don't know. I don't know. I I'm, I I don't know. Um, um, but I think that one of where the ways to command the market in these things red may not be to make it proprietary, but to do it well. I've got a softball question for you. The, the, the teaser on the idea describes an open, scalable database. You didn't get a chance to tell us what that is. What is I, that? I know. I just, I talk too much. Um, but the idea is, is this, that, you know, once you have some basic results there and you can make a credible claim that uh, you have usable information, then there are two ways to bring this to the world. One is to provide feedback to the general public who, with cheap consumer electronics, can monitor their heartbeats. Um, and the other is to argue, to show that this is valuable clinical diagnostic information. Now, on both of those routes, once you can command um, make the credible claim that this has value, you will now have a large, a large flow of data coming towards you. Mm -hmm. I, I was thinking about um, the data you're gathering, and it seems like we already have terabytes of data we don't know what to do with. And I was just thinking that the hypothesis here is that within somebody's heartbeat variability is written their future or some key to what's medically wrong with them. But then we could do the same with EEG, skin color, eye color, fingerprint, voice print. Why should we care about this sort of medically, you know, questionable or potentially meaningless well, um, set of information? Well, I, 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 I disagree that it's, it's quite so randomly chosen because the the work that's been done there on heart rate variability as opposed to variability in shape, but there's a very well-documented literature. There's a huge literature out there that if you just look at the rhythm of heartbeats, you know, if you look at the heart rate variability, this correlates with clinical conditions. And um, again, I plead my naivete, but there is so much individuality in what these things look like that I will tear my considerable hair out if after looking at these shapes that we say, oh no, there's nothing in there. Any more questions? No, thank you. Wonderful. <laughs> All right, our penultimate team. Um, please welcome to the stage with a warm round of applause, Dr. Jean Friedman and Satya Ilumalai, presenting Mouth Lab from Multisensor Diagnostics. Sorry. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for giving us an opportunity to introduce multi-sensor diagnostics. I'm Satya Elumalai, and with me, Dr. Gene Friedman, and we are the founders of uh, Mouth Lab, a tricorder-style, non-invasive handheld device for measuring the overall health of patients. Um, so. Why am I here today? Basically for my mother. Because uh, for me, like she's suffering from multiple chronic conditions and uh, having all these experiences with healthcare, I couldn't like take care of her. I call her twice a day, but I still cannot figure out what's really happening with her health. And every month she goes to a hospital setting and I cannot figure out what's happening with her. I provided apps, I provided technologies, I provided devices, I sent it to India, but I couldn't get a hang of what's really happening with her. And like me, there are a lot of, like more than 40 million caregivers out here in 
in the U.S. are going through the same problem of understanding what's happening with their loved ones. And uh, that's when we came up with an idea of like, what if a single device can measure and monitor their health at a fraction of time and a fraction of a cost? Like, all it takes is a minute. So the whole aim of our idea was to create one device and uh, that can act as an extension of the doctor's office, but uh, all it needs is, like, the patient needs to just put it in their mouth and then, like, uh, hold on for just a minute, And but the information is transferred to us and through the cloud. So... In terms of what MultiLab can measure today, today we can measure temperature, three-lead ECG, uh, breathing rate, breathing pattern, blood oxygen saturation, blood pressure, lung function, pulse rate, and this is, we can measure this, all of this today in less than a minute. And with the availability or the access to breath and saliva, and this is a device, it goes in the mouth, and uh, with the access to breath and saliva and mucous membrane, with our proprietary technology and algorithms, we can capture all the different uh, health parameters, not just now, but in future as well. And we are also supported by a lot of different technologies, like every other devices these days have. But what is really unique is our device can measure all these aspects in a minute. And uh, I don't need any, I mean, there's no introduction for all the cost of care, of healthcare or like chronic condition. Mainly we wanted to focus on CHF because today if you see like 70% of men and 80% of women uh, who are diagnosed with CHF die within 10 years or heart failure within 10 years, which is uh, really crazy than <laughs> cancer. And we wanted to target that and we found a lot of different aspects uh, supporting to help with that. So um, for example, why all these um, so what is the current state of uh, CHF? There's only the weight machine. We are like still 30 to 40 years behind. We're still measuring weight to measure the weight gain uh, or the fluid accumulation. There's nothing other than that. So, Or there's like invasive devices which have shown great value, but they're really expensive. Or there's nurse interventions. For example, like nurse has to call them on a daily basis and check with the patient. But in most cases, that's again is expensive and then we don't have a lot of patients uh, or the nurses to take care of them. Uh, some of the health insurance companies are offering some kind of uh, services where they give a list of all these devices and then they have shown great benefits um, but ultimately what's the problem is it's although we have all these benefits and only 10 percentage of CHF patient population are utilizing this these days and uh, the major problem is compliance and then they don't uh, like wanted to spend a whole lot of time measuring all these things they maybe measure it for a day or a month or even a year but then the problem is it's not like continuous and then they get to the hospital setting again. So here we are with the multi-sensor less than a minute and we require no training. All they have to do is like put it in their mouth. It's really cost effective and we measure everything through breath, saliva, and mucous membrane. And it has significantly increased compliance. So I'm part of PCORI, so I worked with a lot of different patients and patient advocacy group and we did a lot of focus groups to understand whether the patient will use it and we got like overwhelming response to that. Uh, so how the system works is pretty much we work with health insurance companies. We get all the different data from the uh, regarding the patient and then our system like uh, mouth lab is given to the patient and uh, during the PCP visits and they measure it on a daily basis. So the only thing they got to do is like get up in the morning, they brush their teeth and then like stick this device in the mouth and hold it for a minute. And then we measure all these different parameters in real time and then it's sent through the cloud. And um, if there is any abnormality, it sends notification to your provider. But uh, there are other intervention sources that we are providing in terms of telehealth service. So we have expediting that process or in it network appointments or uh, through retail clinics. So where this big data comes in or uh, our analytic system chips in is imagine we are measuring all these different data points. All these medical measurements that we are measuring today, we can correlate all those things with um, single, not just single patient, but multiple patients. Today, to that end, we are working with a renowned cardiologist at Johns Hopkins, uh, Dr. Russell um, and he is uh, like helping us to compare the data with the hemodynamic uh, monitors that is today used. So we, we are trying to predict what's happening with the onset when for a patient who is having an um, invasive device so that we compare that with our device. And in future, we are also planning to work with uh, another cardiologist to actually expand to do a transitional care intervention studies where we can get all these data, compare all the medical measurements with the patient uh, predicted uh, value so that 
that we can get to the stage where we can predict an onset way before it becomes uh, an emergency or the patient needs to go to a hospital setting. So our system is, is like due to the time, I'm, this is our system. We have multiple uh, entry points as well as intervention platform that we offer and all the data is accumulated. For example, specifically for CHF patient, other than weight, there are other factors like increase in respiratory rate, uh, increase in pulse rate and reduction in blood pressure. These values can contribute to what's happening with future patients. Um, so in that we create value to help all the different stakeholders in healthcare, specifically to health insurance companies because they are the ones that's gonna pay us to do these uh, activities. Specifically around, we are trying to target unaddressable market in terms of specifically using the device to cap, uh, help patient improve their care, increase telehealth utilization, as well as uh, we support like star risk adjustment and all the different aspects of um, care. We sell the product to our health insurance company for one uh, uh, one time device cost and then associated uh, encounter facilitation and support fees. And uh, we are, in terms of competitive advantage, we are unique that we take like just a minute, like it's a rapid advantage, we are patent protected and we are clinically proven. Um, this is our team and uh, we have a team of renowned scientists and um, technologists at Hopkins and we are also part of Startup Health Incubator um, when it comes to these are industry alliance and uh, we are so just to recap, we are uh, patent protected, we have a unique device, and we are not promising here to provide uh, an app or an interface or a technology, but rather we wanted to change the culture of care monitoring. So tomorrow it should be like an acronym, okay, let's use MultLab to measure this. And all it needs is like one minute and patients can have, don't have to worry about it. My mother or my grandmother, she does not need to know what's happening with her health, but I'm there as a caregiver to take care of her. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I'll be happy to take some questions. David, our first question. I know it, it seems trivial, but a minute for a person or a patient when they're dealing with something is actually quite a long time. And to hold something in your mouth in a, in a, in a sort of, hey, I'm going to pick it up and do this. Have you, do you have any like real data on compliance because that's that's always the biggest challenge. So we have a data on uh, the sensitivity and specificity, and then we also did a huge study at the Johns Hopkins uh, where we used 52 members study, but then we also interviewed more than 100 patients in terms of whether they can use the device, and then we also had focus group with respect to PCORI. But in terms of the actual compliance, we need to actually develop our final prototype uh, or device. We have fully engineered prototype now, which is working, it looks great, but we need to put it across uh, different settings. Yeah. I mean, w one general thought is just to narrow down the use case mm -hmm. a little bit in the beginning, right? Uh, retail clinics or yeah. those acute events or somewhere, right. telehealth, some, yeah. something just because I, I think the compliance issue right. might, might, might be a challenge. Well, so so you, you had mentioned the patent a couple of times. Yeah. What are the claims? What exactly does the technology, your technology do? So in terms of first, the device itself, uh, like we, we are in the mouth and then we are one. So this was uh, filed in 2010, way before any of the competitors or anyone out there who were thinking about this kind of technology. So first of all, the way we capture uh, from breath and then how the device sits in the mouth and then as well as the mouthpiece. The mouthpiece is a detachable mouthpiece. If you look at it, you can just detach it and then it's gonna, it's gonna take just a, I mean, you can just throw it. It's gonna be like few cents. So basically the other idea was also, it's like it should be a multi-user device. So the patent, first patent focus on all those things. The second patent focus on all the placement of the sensor, where we are placing the sensor, as well as the algorithm of how multiple sensors are working at the same time and providing these data in real time. So that's the second patent, which is focused on that. So a couple, I, a couple yeah, questions. Yeah. One is, you know, from the practical point of view, you have sent, I can believe the heart rate and the, and the uh, spirometry stuff, but more or less the other things. How do you calibrate this thing? So, okay. So um, the, uh, almost every measurement in there is absolute, um, except for the blood pressure. Okay, blood pressure is cal uh, calibrated for an individual person. 
right? Mm -hmm. So the intent of this device, and this addresses your question too, there is a focus for this device now. It's not uh, like what Satya said, it is intended for everybody, and yes, mm -hmm. it would be great if, 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 if a kid gets sick, mom pulls this thing out, says here, okay? That would be great, okay, and we're getting there. The first step for this device is for chronically ill patients, and not all chronically ill patients, for congestive heart failure patients specifically. Right, but okay. you've uniquely so, picked yeah. a yeah. number of um, variables which have been shown not to correlate with admissions in the heart failure space. I mean, except for weight, yes. uh, or except, you know, there are so many companies that, uh, you know, call people up, do this, right. the nurses do this, or whatever. You know, and you can reduce it down to a certain admissions down to a certain number, no matter how you do it. I just see absolutely nothing unique about what you're trying to do in terms of the the, and we're Hopkins guys, so yeah, I feel yeah. bad doing this, <laughs> but you know, I see nothing unique in what specifically you're trying to measure, and anything unique about the model in which you're trying to implement it. I, I applaud the, uh, the concept and approach, and I think you've picked a very good market to go into. The question is, how do you differentiate yourself, and why should I believe that what you're doing matters? Okay, so our, so, well, okay. So first of all, why do we go to the mouth, right? We went to the mouth because there is saliva and there is breath, which offers huge amounts of biomarkers right there. We can, in principle, collect in, an enormous amount of information, okay? Now, the first thing we wanted to do was collect what everybody else collects now from various sources, okay? These are, these are standard parameters, uh, blood pressure, and so on, uh, a pulse rate, and so on. So, um, so now we can collect these. Now, the issue with the congestive heart failure patients. Uh, the issue with any chronic patients is they're more susceptible to getting sick. They're sick, they're more susceptible to getting sick. So we wanted to have that kind of capability. The question was, can we use this for heart failure? your patients, okay? And so one, uh, so an interesting thing that came up is I started investigating, well, I'm an engineer, right? So I started investigating, well, why is it that, uh, that uh, uh, doctors want patients to collect their weight? Okay. Well, they want patients to collect their weight because the heart can't pump as well and the water is retained. And what's the problem with that? Problem with that is pulmonary edema, okay? You can't breathe very well, okay? Now, we're in the mouth. A patient takes, picks this up every single day, right, in the morning. They, they, they have to go to the restroom. It's part of their routine. They pick it up. They put it in, okay? We can detect everything that's happening to their breath within one minute. We can detect shallowness of breath. We can detect increased pulse rate. We can detect lowered blood pressure. All of those, are, in, in, in fact, are clinical indicators of something that's happening. I'm not a doctor. No, 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 just but just last question. I'm sorry to do that. Sure. Sorry, <laughs> I, it may be well a follow-up, okay. which is, yeah, do you ahead. have, or have you generated at this point, evidence that in your initial focus yes. of heart failure, the set of measurements you take can predict a decompensation earlier or better or differently than a series of once daily weight measures. Okay, this is the next study. What we've done so far is we've published a study in the Annals of Biomedical Engineering which shows the accuracy of the measurements that we are currently taking. Mm -hmm. So then my last question as a follow-up yes. to that is that one of the biggest problems with ambulatory blood pressure monitoring is that people don't do it right. You give them this and, you know, they said, oh, I, I didn't take my blood pressure. I ran Absolutely. out to the car. Now I run back and I put it on. Now my okay. blood pressure is high. Or they went to the bathroom. They, they urinated yeah. before they did this. So all of this stuff. Right. You know, how are you, how are okay. you going to get It's all automatic. I know exactly where you're going. I'm, I have 18 seconds. Sorry. It's all, basically, it's all automatic in terms of the, uh, I mean, the natural question that comes up from every engineer, how do we take blood pressure, okay? Use pulse transit time, okay? The amount of time it takes for the heart to pump uh, for, and, and then subsequently for that pulse wave to reach the extremities is correlated directly to blood pressure, okay? That's how we do it. There is no way to do it wrong. You stick it in, that's no, but it. It's when you do it. Right. If you do it regularly, which is the, the intent is to have this be part of your daily routine, right? You go, you stick it in for just like a toothbrush. You brush your teeth every day. This would be a thing you do if you're a chronically ill patient. Great. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. All right.
right. So we are down to the last presenter of the night. Uh, we've done, I think, 20 or so, 20 or more of these uh, types of events. And we still don't really, I don't think we've crunched the data on whether it's better to go last or better to go first. Um, and I guess if your name is Pillow, you might not want to go last. But don't hold that against them. <laughs> Don't think of your pillows. Uh, this is a great team um, representing Pillow, really cute robot, uh, Dr. Aidan Feng and Emmanuel Mussini. Welcome. Hello, my name is Aidan. I'm uh, one of the co-founders at uh, Pillow Health. Uh, can you raise your hand if you know who Amazon Alexa is? Wow, that's, that's a lot of you. Well, today I'm going to introduce you to Alexa's friend, and his name is Pillow. So, um, there we go. So, the first problem we're addressing is that one that we all know very well. Medication non-adherence creates over $300 billion uh, in avoidable healthcare costs each year. Uh, and the second problem is the absence of health and wellness touch points in the home. As our population gets older and live longer, uh, the number of patients with chronic conditions will rise. And in the current health system, our touch points and points for data collection uh, occur at periodic office visits or during hospitalizations, at which time it's already too late. So what can we do? Uh, you know, as much as patients love me, I, I don't know. I, I think very few of them would actually invite me to go live with them. So. Um, so we created someone much more beautiful and much more intelligent than me who would fit seamless, seamlessly into any home. So first and foremost, Pillow is an intelligent companion. He can see, hear, speak, and even learn. These, uh, these functionalities enable Pillow to proactively interact with patients, uh, increasing engagement, and creating an enjoyable home health experience. Now, he also securely stores and dispenses medications and reorders them at the right time. He can intelligently answer health-related questions and uh, connect with telemedicine services and sync with wearable and, uh, and wireless monitoring devices like uh, Mouth Lab over there. So, um, but above all, uh, Pillow is able to generate real-time data from inside the home. And that, that is uh, what's special here. And uh, you know, we collect data about patients' habits and behaviors while they're in their natural habitat. So now, let's dive into the Pillow experience. Pillow is a device that user is gonna, be, uh, is gonna want to use every single day. An intel uh, interactive, intelligent uh, uh, assistant that speaks to you and recognizes you. Facial recognition not only creates a social and personal experience, but also ensures security for medication dispensing. Uh, so, and on the screen, uh, we, the patient can see additional information and multimedia content, uh, all that in addition to the amazing big blue eyes. So uh, on the back end, Pillow stores up to 300 pills and uh, in 28 different slots in a medication tray pre-filled by the pharmacy. And uh, customizable alerts and interactions are, encourage regular use and engagement. And connectivity allows Pillow to be the health hub of the home. Whoops, sorry. So we created Pillow to sit at the intersection of two very timely trends, uh, and that is the rise of home voice-based assistance and uh, the application of technology to health and wellness. And at this intersection, Pillow is able to collect patient data that I would have never even dreamed of. So, so I classify this data into four different categories. So the first is you know, uh, basic patient demographic data. Second is uh, wellness and biometric inputs from peripheral devices. Third, it's real-time medication-related inputs, such as adherence data, side effect, and medication uh, interactions uh, uh, monitoring. But most interesting, uh, interestingly, and the fourth, is user action data that tracks engagement with Pillow, times those interactions, and gives us an idea of what is on the patient's mind through, uh, through the questions that Pillow receives. Devices on the market today uh, can give uh, us a window into one of these categories. And as a result, though, the data often is siloed. And breaking down these silos and analyzing this data altogether is the core of Pillow's value proposition. So 
com now combining both the da data that Pillow generates and the data that it aggregates from uh, as the hub of a health platform, we're able to build a very powerful analytics engine. The streamlined data would make population health management much more efficient, alert caregivers and providers when risk, high risk situations occur, and prevent catastrophic or uh, costly events such as you know hospitalizations or ER visits. And because of how valuable this data is, we've received a tremendous of interest uh, uh, from large firms in each of these categories over the six, past six months. And we've received a letter of intent from a major healthcare supply chain firm uh, focusing on home health and long-term care with plans to invest at least a million dollars. We also uh, have a multinational pharmaceutical firm uh, participating in our current seed rounds and committing to a 2,000 unit pilot. And our business model uh, will focus on B to B to C sales. Um, and uh, we, but also we want to allow customers to purchase Pillow directly from us. So for di these direct sales, we'll offer a basic option and a premium, op premium option. The basic option will be $349. The premium one will be $199 plus a $19 uh, monthly subscription. But more importantly, the primary channel will be strategic partnerships. Uh, we'll charge a setup fee of around $99 and work with our partners to develop uh, a monthly subscription plan that suits their specific uh, uh, needs. So, and on top of that, our partners will have access to the analytics engine to better manage their patient populations. So, in terms of the progress we've made thus far, uh, we generated our over $118,000 in uh, pre orders on Indiegogo last year uh, before we even had a prototype. And uh, since then, our first prototype is now ready, and uh, we're focusing on building these partnerships. And later this year, we're conducting user testing and pilots and with uh, full product rollout uh, early next year, first half of next year. In terms of product development. We're currently working to develop our Alpha 2 prototype, uh, which will be ready later this spring, and uh, large-scale manufacturing uh, will start uh, later this year. But now, taking a step back. So what I presented to you thus far is only the beginning. Our vision is to, for Pillow to become the centerpiece of health and wellness in the home. Um, so it, you know, it's going to be more than a rich source of data or a medication adherence tool, but rather it's going to be an extension of our health system in our homes. Um, and the future of healthcare will be in our homes. Uh, so we, as we're achieving this vision, we've been careful to protect our IP. We already filed two uh, patent applications and have two underway at the moment. And we have a very balanced team with extensive entrepreneurial experience, deep technical knowledge, and clinical insights. And if you're interested in an in-person demonstration, please let me know. Thank you. We can't wait to meet you soon. I'm kind of interested in, in the care and feeding of Pillow. Um, <laughs> if, uh, who has to uh, give it inputs, and what are they? And why would they do that? Is this on? OK, great. So uh, that's very interesting. So there's uh, two different aspects. One is feeding the data in, so what medications I take and et cetera. The second is actually filling the medications, uh, physical medications, into the device itself. So uh, I'll, address, I'll address the second part first, and that is um, you know, uh, for the alpha prototype, uh, we, uh, we're going to do initial user testing by having the patients or having a caretaker uh, uh, put the fill the medications in. But uh, as we're uh, for the larger pilot, we will be shipping pre-filled uh, disposable trays that can be just popped into the device lock the hatch, and you're ready to go. So uh, that's, as I mentioned, uh, part of the uh, larger, uh, uh, one of our investors is going to be sponsoring that, and will be, will be uh, one of the patents is actually on the disposable tray. Now, for this first part of the question, um, the insertion of the medication data into uh, the device itself. So we have an accompanying mobile app in which either the caretaker or the patient, uh, him or herself, can insert the medication uh, data, doses, times into it directly. And as we get more advanced, uh, you know, uh, probably uh, in 2018, we hope to integrate with pharmacy sy systems so that the data, when they load the tray, is uploaded into our, our uh, cloud and uh, can be transmitted onto pillow. And where's the pharmacist in this loop? 
Where, where is Where's the pharmacist? Yeah, you, uh, you mentioned that there's a tray at the pharmacist yeah. that the pharmacist fills, but uh, I'm just wondering. Oh, the, the location. Do, do you need a pharmacist in order to do this, or does uh, it have to go to a pharmacy? Or right. So, will you ship directly as a pharmacy? Oh, understood. So, uh, essentially, our partnership will be with a uh, mail order pharmacy. Got it. So, so uh, it doesn't really uh, matter, but uh, as where that, they are, that but does matter. Long. Yeah. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> but they they will ship the medication. Yeah. So. Go ahead, please. I was just, um, one of the things about, uh, so I love that concept, but I know that in, in the real world, um, what this requires is that a, a patient actually be at home during the time that the medication is dispensed. Right. So you people take people go on vacation, uh, they are away, they need medicine in the middle of the day, or they may not be home in the evenings. And so what this requires is alternate forms of input. So I assume a smartphone or something like that. So the question I would have is, it's not really clear to me. Uh, there seems to be this notion that you need this connected device that sits in one place, or alternately, you have a smartphone that goes everywhere with you that performs all the same functions. The only difference is that this contains pills in it. Mm -hmm. Pills can be contained by anything. Um, right. um, so I just wanted to understand a little bit more about, um, other than the wow factor of this cool device that sits there, talk to us about how exactly this will be operationalized and what the advantages of this system. Yes. So uh, in response to that, I have, I have uh, two points. And the first is... Uh, I cannot underemphasize the value of social interaction. So, so you know, the, the reason that uh, Alexa took off or Google Home, since we're here, uh, took off is that is that uh, is that you know people value the voice interaction as if they're speaking to a to a person uh, to someone who who understands them. And it's our bet that in the uh, you know uh, 40 and above population, uh, they will value that even more. Now, the second part to that is compared to a smartphone app, what we found in uh, com uh, comparing to competitors such as MetaSafe is that uh, customers suffer from notification or reminder fatigue on the phone. So I get 10 emails in 10 minutes, and along with a medication to take uh, a reminder to take my medication, uh, I just often it's very easy to ignore. I s touch the snooze button and uh, I'm done. But this is much more, more difficult to ignore when someone is actually speaking to you and telling you to take your pills. So, so a sorry. beautiful- had a question. He was oh, I'm sorry. waiting patiently. Please, please. No, 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 go ahead, go ahead. Wait, go on. So, <laughs> <laughs> we're too kind. Um, people take a lot of medications, right? Yeah. Uh, insulin, diabetics at home. Nobody actually likes to keep their health care out on display. Right. right, it's not necessarily something that they always want to be reminded of. Why do you think that people will want the pillow versus versus kind of keeping their health care hidden? Right. So I think uh, obviously, obviously, when when uh, when we roll out the even in this uh, probably in the Alpha Two prototype, <laughs> we'll have the option to uh, make answers and questions more discreet, so that you know uh, when when someone a visitor is over, I will not name the medications that that you're on, but rather I just say hello. I have a reminder for you, uh, and the user can can toggle that back and forth. And in resp uh, in response to you know Pillow versus Amazon X Alexa or Google Home, I um, I think that uh, while we do have this. Uh, niche and focus on healthcare. Uh, our aim is actually, uh, and the initial prototype already does this as well, is actually to be able to answer this qu uh, the the normal questions of what's the weather like today, or or uh, how many calories are in this that that Google Home or Ale Amazon Alexa are able to answer as well. So so um, we we're, we're trying to create a healthcare device that will meet your daily needs uh, in taking care of yourself. So, Aiden, congratulations on the concept. But, you know, many times you've referenced two titans. Why startup? Why don't they move into this space or another highly resourced company? Because it sounds like a lot of engineering challenges. You know, what's the, what's the threshold here? Yeah, I, I think, um, I think, I don't think, so I feel, as I said before, we're at the intersection of two very distinct trends and industries. So, so you know, uh, Google and Amazon came out with their devices, but 
uh, they made the choice to focus on entertainment and day-to-day and -day needs. And the healthcare companies have traditionally focused on apps and, and uh, uh, care management programs. So I think we're the first in this area at this intersection and, and we have intellectual property. And if large companies are interested, and they have been, we're obviously very interested in partnering with them and furthering develop this, developing this product together. Great. Thank you, Pillow. So that's all of our six presentations. Great job. Um, judges, please um, tally your scores and rank the, uh, the presentations with no number one being Best. The ones you like the best, and number six, the one you don't like the best. <laughs> um, and Abby will be around to tally the scores. Um, so if you guys could do that. And while the judges are doing that, we're just going to take a few minutes right now to recognize our sponsors and partners who made this event possible. Um, as we've said, this has been a huge effort on everyone's part. So we've really enjoyed all the partners and sponsors coming together and working to create this. Um, first, we want to say thank you to Google. Clearly, we love your headquarters. <laughs> um, a special thanks to the cloud services and the 25,000 in Google Cloud credits for the winners, and to Verily for giving us uh, a judge for the evening. Uh, spe <laughs> special thanks to Heidi Dosh, Senior Program Manager at Google, for being our Google champion. She's out in the crowd somewhere. Oh, I'm next. OK. Uh, Another uh, local sponsor right here in Kendall Square, we want to say thanks to Optum Labs. Um, they uh, came on board to, um, to help us spread the word about this, uh, this great challenge that we're having focused on big data. Um, and uh, I believe they're, um, uh, we have some people uh, from Optum Labs here tonight. If you're interested in what they do, uh, feel free to say hello to them afterwards in the, uh, 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 the other room there. We, have, uh, we will be serving, I think, coffee and desserts as well at the end. Thank you to Core Idea, a premier medical device incubator driven by an innovative translational healthcare approach. And to Red Mile Group, uh, one of our judges uh, from Red Mile Group, uh, the Healthcare Investment Fund, um, investing in public and private uh, med device and uh, digitally enabled service companies since 2008. Thank you to Partners Healthcare, a um, non-for-profit healthcare system that is committed to patient care research, teaching, and service to the community that has the nation's largest academic research enterprise with $1.6 in annual research volume. Uh, thanks also to Stat News uh, for being a partner, helping us spread the word. I'm sure you've all heard of Stat News. It's a great website um, uh, with great reporting on the trends in health and especially digital health. Thank you to Pulse at Mass Challenge. Um, the most startup-friendly digital health lab, connecting entrepreneurs to experts, institutions, and resources with no equity taken. Um. Also to Johns Hopkins Technology Ventures. Uh, they are the technology uh, licensing division um, and uh, investment uh, fund uh, at Johns Hopkins. And thank you to MassMedic, which is an organization of medical device manufacturers, suppliers, and associated nonprofit groups in Massachusetts and their surrounding region. Um, it is having these great relationships to support the community that dr drive innovative solutions for patient care. So big round of applause for them. All right, how are we doing with the scores? I think Abby is now tallying. Um, one other interesting thing we've decided to do tonight uh, is we are going to give away, um, you may have seen a, a company called Pavlock outside. They make a, a wristband that shocks you to make you uh, give up things that you want to give up, um, like smoking or eating too much or drinking too much. Um, <laughs> it, uh, it's based on the sort of, uh, I guess, the reverse of uh, Pavlov's dog, right? It uh, makes you do a bad, uh, gives you a bad stimulus to avoid a bad outcome. Anyway, um, they have generously offered to give away three devices to people who uh, not only got tickets, but also checked in today. Um, and if you're here, we've got the devices here. If you're not here, we'll contact you later. The first winner is Timothy Scalaban. Here? Not here? 
We'll contact him later. Next, Zane Kassam. No? Okay, and finally, Rebecca Davis. All right. Oh, wait, over there. Rebecca Davis. Hey. <laughs> we, we have your shock bracelets. <laughs> Thank you. Of wine. <laughs> it could work for glasses of wine if you have too many tonight. <laughs> okay, you want to do that? Finally, this amazing event took a lot of work and dedication from the MedTech Boston and Boston Scientific team. So we want to say a special thank you to those team members. Abby Ballou, our managing editor, who I think we have at work tallying the scores. Um, Stacy. Kermit Hook, Boston Scientific Global Innovation Senior Program Manager. <laughs> Dr. Mark Bowden, Boston Scientific Director of Corporate Research, Materials Testing, and Characterization Lab. Amanda Jebbard, Boston Scientific Senior Communication Specialist. <laughs> and Randy Scheistel, Boston Scientific Vice President of Research and Development Global Technology. Please stand up and <laughs> let us recognize you. Thank you. <laughs> oh, did we get the bit? Okay. Uh, MTD2. Oh, I guess that's me. All right. And finally, before we announce the winners, one other announcement. Um, we want to let you all know about another great event that's happening uh, very soon, uh, also sponsored by Boston Scientific in collaboration with the Massachusetts Medical Device Development Center, M2D2, which is at UMass Lowell. Um, it's the M2D2 100K Challenge, and it's going to showcase biotech and med device ventures. They're going to compete to win uh, in-kind development services provided by the sponsors, and the winners will be announced on April 6th. So um, we welcome you to take a look at that. Just uh, you could Google M2D2 100K Challenge, find out all about it, and uh, hopefully you can attend. <laughs> all right. Do we have our winners yet? Are we going to have to start dancing? I think you're going to dance. Uh, um, <laughs> we also want to thank Dr. David Knapp, Vice President of Research and Development at Boston Scientific, who gave some introductory remarks earlier. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> we could hum the theme to Jeopardy. <laughs> this is very awkward. Um, <laughs> Um, we didn't prepare this much material. Okay, um, why don't you uh, just go out and you. see? Thank you. Oh, thank us? Thank sure. You. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for having us. <laughs> I'll say hello to my mother and father watching on the live stream. Hi, mom. Hi, dad. John, did you come prepared for more remarks to give at the end? No, you didn't come prepared. <laughs> <laughs> you, you do have more slides. <laughs> more innovation, disruption. You're going to pick a disruptor. <laughs> Um. All right, we will just go see what's going on, and hopefully we'll have a winner very soon. Do is, is Abby outside? <laughs> ah, kind of like deer in the head. Oh, yay. Do <laughs> you want to get? Hmm? Hmm? Oh, they, I think they, yeah. So who would like to do the, the honors? <laughs> yeah. It's not La La Land, no. Two handouts. 
All right, folks. So, uh, yeah, as as was as was just uh, alluded to, this was the most stressful moment for me of the evening, given what just happened in the Oscars. But anyway. Um, <clears throat> You know, so uh, obviously amazing uh, presentations from folks. So I want to thank everybody on the team, thank everybody here, uh, as well as all of the people that presented uh, their work and taking the excellent questions from the judges. So uh, with, uh, I guess, no further ado, the runner up I'll start with uh, is Pillow. Great. Thank you so much. It's an honor, and uh, we can't wait to, to bring healthcare into our homes. <laughs> All right. Okay, and the moment everyone is waiting for, the winner is Medumo. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, everyone. It's a tremendous honor. We look forward to working uh, with the teams at Google as well as Boston Scientific to advance our technology and hopefully continue to make a difference in the lives of patients. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you to our presenters, our judges, and thank you to Boston Scientific. Um, if all the judges and finalists and Boston Scientific members could come to the front. We're going to do some pictures. Um, does the bar still open? Yeah, the bar is still open. The bar is still open. <laughs> <laughs> so please, <laughs> please stay around, continue to mingle, um, and have a good time. <laughs> yeah, all right.